And the little boy said, what does that mean? And he said, not a thing. <laughs> <laughs> I also want you to know that uh, I know some of you called me over the weekend. You said, are you okay? Is there anything going on with you? Is that what this maybe um, that's troubling when you would speak um, with the storms of life? We're fine. She did break her foot again. You can see that if you look at it. But that's, we're not a rookie to that one. We've been there 13 times, so that's not anything new. But um, I appreciate your checking. And I want to send this to you. Um, as well. So I want to make sure you know that I'm grateful we can talk about things substantively. And I want you to know how grateful I am that we take to heart that what God put in the Bible, we put in the Bible for a reason. And he has an order in the scripture that we do to well to respect and understand. I also want you to know that you can have the joy of the Lord and still speak about some things that aren't easy. True. So if you're saying, I'm like, well, Pastor Ron, you can be intense. I know that. <laughs> but I'm still the goofy pastor you know. And so I just want to tell you a couple of things to get started before we dig in and we'll get in, we'll get in just a minute. I was talking to Stephanie the other day when she was telling me some of the jokes that she told, tells the grandchildren. Okay? For example, why do, why do bees have sticky hair? Because they hang around with honeycomb. Ooh, get the hook. <laughs> Why did the little boy throw the butter out the window? Because he wanted to see a butterfly. Uh, so no, I'm not an upset food. I'm not discouraged. I'm not forlorn. I'm not any of those kinds of things. But I do want to be true to my calling. And as I looked at this next passage of scripture, and if you read it, you know where we're going. We're going to be in Mark chapter 5. We're going to try to take 20 verses on today because it's all one there that we need to talk about. it. You know you're not going to have a conversation like this at Walmart. You know you're not going to have a conversation like this at Walmart. You're not going to have too many conversations on the phone to go like this. You're not going to read about it in the newspaper or see it on the news. But we're a church. And when we're a church, we want to get into God. And when we're a church, we want to get into the things of God. And it's so important to, to remember that. Last week when we were together, what did we see? We saw that there's times that there's storms in life. And they're not just all one variety. There are multitudes of varieties. Some storms are physical. You say to your body, get going. Your body says, I'm going as hard as I can. Some storms that come are financial, and people think, like, oh my gracious, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just finding my account just depleting faster and faster, and I'm trying more and more to be able to take care of things. Sometimes the storms that come into life are relational. And some people you've been close to all of your life, and then all of a sudden you feel them pulling back, or maybe drawing away and, and letting go in ways that you never thought that they would. Some storms are all different kinds of things, and some storms are spiritual. And that's the hardest one sometimes for people to say amen to. It's the hardest one for people to recognize, but believe me, it's very true. There are spiritual storms in this world, and oftentimes the spiritual storms are the most powerful of all. And sometimes we don't want to admit when we're struggling. Sometimes we don't want to admit when we feel like we're going back a little bit. But who would deny the existence of spiritual storms? Think, think about it just for a while. Think about what you see in the paper. Think about what you see on the news. How can you not recognize their spiritual storms that are going on? Amen. Think about the times when you told yourself, I'm not going to ever listen to that again. But you listen to it again. I'm not ever going to say that again. And you said it again. Think about the times you said, I'm never going to go there anymore with my feet, in my heart, in my mind, in my spirit, in my soul. And yet you did over and over again. Why? Because spiritual storms are very real. They're very powerful. And today we're going to be talk, taking a look at where Mark is taking us next in Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. And he's going to go deep with spiritual storms. And I think it's really important to understand what's being said. So let's go to Lord in prayer and then we'll dig in. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you're a great God. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that even as we heard the music today, that when we can't see your hand, we can always trust your heart. Thank you, Lord, that we are not alone in this storm, that you're the calmer of the seas, whatever the seas may be. You're the calmer of the storms, whatever variety they may come in. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you always have a word for us. You never leave us neglected. And even the things we have to stand under, Lord, you give us the fortitude to be able to do that. Father, we pray today that we will put aside the, the burdens and the cares of this world for a while. We pray, Lord, that we really want to do business with you. We pray, Lord, that we'd ask you to prepare our heart to be able to receive the things you have for us collectively, but individually as well. Father, we thank you, Lord, that your, your word speaks to our heart like nothing else. And Father, we pray today that we would do business with your word. Father, we pray that we take it in, and Father, we pray we live it out. 
But Father, we pray, Lord, that if we need encouragement, that we come to you and we come to the family of faith and we stand strong together through whatever we're facing. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that you're with us right now. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's dig into Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. We've been in a journey, verse by verse, journey through the Gospel of Mark. And if you've been with us, you know that Mark has presented Jesus in various ways. He has said that Jesus is the Christ. He has said that Jesus is the Messiah. He said that Jesus is the promised Redeemer. And he's the Son of God who came in human flesh. Doc, Mark documented victory after victory that Jesus demonstrated. He, de he demonstrated the Lord's victory over temptation. His miraculous teaching that was so amazing that when people heard what he had to say, they were absolutely, utterly astonished. And then he, ex he cited example after example of Jesus' authority. He talked about Jesus' authority over disease. He talked about Jesus' authority over impairment and even nature and evil itself. With a simple touch, what did Jesus do for Peter's mother-in-law? He took the raging fever away. At the Lord's command, what did he do for the leper? The leper was fully healed. A paralyzed person was fully restored. And evil spirits were sent out. And even the seas were calmed. And the winds were calmed when they were in the midst of what the seasoned fishermen said was a great storm. Well, how did the apostles respond to all these things? Well, Mark chapter 4, verse 41 answers that question, telling us they were terrified. In other words, they were more than impressed. They were absolutely amazed. They were in awe. And they asked each other, who is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. In other words, who is this one named Jesus? He is different from anyone else we've ever met. There never has been nor will there ever be anyone else like him. Don't pass over that question too quickly. Who is this one whose name is Jesus? That is the question of all questions. No other question ever has been or ever will be more important. The scripture tells us how we choose to answer that question. And that's a choice each of us have to make for ourselves. It affects our life. There's no doubt about that. But it also determines our destination throughout all of eternity. Mark knew that. He was receiving divine revelation from God, and he faithfully recorded everything the Spirit of God led him to share. So let's continue our study. Look with me what happens next. Mark chapter 5, let's get the first five verses as we begin. They, this is Jesus and the apostles, went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had been chained hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Now when you're starting the Bible, you need to ask some questions. And the first question I ask when I read this particular passage is, where were all these things taking place? Well, Jesus and his disciples were in a place called the Gerasenes. It was located primarily in Gentiles in Jim territory, territory, the territory of Decapolis, is on the northeast shore of the Sea of Galilee, about six miles southeast and across the sea from Capernaum. Right after Jesus gets out of the boat, remember in the storm we talked about last week? Right after he gets out of the boat with his apostles, what does he start to do? They start to walk up a hill. And as they walk up the hill, where are they going? They're going to a village. And on the way, what did they have to pass through? They have to pass through a graveyard. And when they walk through this graveyard, what are they confronted with? They're confronted by a demon-possessed man. Now, when describing what took place, Matthew talks about this too. And in his particular gospel, what does he say? He said that there were two demon-possessed men who were there. But when Luke and Mark talk about it, they focused on only one of them, the more troubled, the one who was more challenged, if you will. Earlier that evening, the apostles feared a, very, feared a very violent storm on the sea, but now they're about to encounter something that's even more frightening. The man that approached them was in the midst of the tombs. He was in an ancient cemetery. That's where he lived. It was a place that if you talk to the Jews, they would say, unclean, unclean, stay away from that ground, don't even go close to it at all. If you talk to the Gentiles, and that's where this was going on, they said that the place where he was was haunted. Mark tells us that the demon-possessed man had supernatural strength. No one 
God, he said, could overpower him. No chain could bind him. No shackles could restrain him. This man not only lived in the tombs, what else does he do? Think about what we just read. He screamed. Can you imagine being around this guy? He howled in the middle of the night. He gnashed his teeth. And then what else did he do? He mutilated his own flesh. Talk about a powerful combination. Talk about somebody who's under travail. Talk about somebody who's under oppression. Now, why was this man so out of control? Well, let me answer that question very directly. He was demon-possessed. You don't hear too many sermons about demon possession, do you? We don't even talk about it that often, but when we come to it, we're not going to deny it. We're not going to skip through it. There is such thing as demon possession. Now, I know what you know. Some people would say, we don't even believe in the existence of demons at all. And if they do exist, they certainly can't possess a person. Yet, what do we see in this particular passage? This passage presents to us the reality of the existence of demons. And make no mistake about it, they have great power. Now, please hear my words very closely and very carefully, but far more importantly, hear biblical truth. The Bible teaches very plainly that there is a spirit world that exists. There are angels, and amen to that, but there are also evil spirits in the spirit world. The word evil is significant. It's very significant. It's not talking about somebody who's having a bad day. Not talking about somebody who's a little bit troubled. Not talking about somebody who's a little bit, little bit overwhelmed at the moment. It's not talking about somebody who just makes a mistake here and there. What's the Bible talking about? It says it's evil. And again, that's a very significant term. It's not only a potent descriptive term. It describes the very nature and the very mission that these folks, these spirits are in. That's why when we speak about Satan, my best word for Satan is evil one. Because that term lets us know right from the get-go his nature and it lets us know his mission. It is his, his intent. It is his objective. It is his desire to take you down, to take me down, to discourage us, to overwhelm us, and to believe that we can't stand as strong as what the Bible tells us. Make no mistake about it, demons are real, they are powerful, and they are dangerous. And what was going on with this man? He was possessed by these demons, and he was possessed so greatly that the people around that area, they wouldn't even travel on that road because they didn't want to come upon this man. Those who lived in this area, they're absolutely afraid of him, and they had good reason to be afraid of him. Again, think about his strength. His strength is so strong that he can tear a chain apart. You don't see that every day, do you? What else could he do? He could break shackles. That would get my attention. I saw somebody breaking shackles. And he cried out and he howled day and night as he cut himself with stones. Talk about intense. Talk about challenging. Well, what happened next? Look at me at verses 6 through 10. When he, this is a demon-possessed man, saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. What a conversation this is that's going on. The man who was possessed by evil spirits, what did he know about Jesus? He knew that Jesus was and is the Son of God. And when he addresses them, he addresses them accordingly, doesn't he, when you see his words. He even got on his knees before he came to the Lord when he spoke those words. Not only did he recognize that Jesus is the Christ, but he knew what else do we see in that passage. He knew one day he would be judged by the Lord Jesus Christ. In the book of Luke, if you look up this, this, um, this passage, you'll see that he gives a little bit more detail. Listen to some of Luke's words in Luke 8.31. It says, and they, or the demons, begged him, that's Jesus, repeatedly not to order them into the abyss. Now, you don't hear the word abyss very often either, so let me show you what the word abyss means. It literally means something that's bottomless. You ever read the book of the Revelation where one day the evil one will be put in the bottomless pit? That's what it's talking about. It's talking about the, abit of the abyss, something that's bottomless. If you're familiar with the New Testament, you know in the book of the Revelation, in multiple places, this is the place where the unrighteous await their final judgment. Well, clearly the demons were, were absolutely troubled. They had power, but their power was absolutely no match for the power of Jesus. It's important to know and remember that the spirits that opposed Christ were well aware of what? They were well aware that their time is limited. Well aware that their time is limited. Sometimes people keep telling me, 
you know what? He one just keeps on bringing up my past. And I said, well, I'll tell you what I heard a long time ago. When he brings up your past, bring up his future. Because your past won't last anywhere near as long as his future. What did they know? They knew that their time was limited. What else did they know? They knew that their judgment was sure, and they knew that their judgment was certain. And amen to that. Well, how did the Lord respond to this man? Look with me as the verses continue. Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 through 13. A large herd of pig was feeding on a nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus. No, they didn't just ask. They begged Jesus, send us among the pigs to allow them to go into them. He, or Jesus, gave them permission, and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake, and they were drowned. Wow. Can you imagine walking and seeing all these things going on? What a sight that must have been. And how did the people who were taking care of the pigs respond? Well, let's look at what happened. Look at me at verses 14 through 17. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by a legion of demons sitting there, dressed in, in his right mind, and they were afraid. That would get your attention, wouldn't it? Those who had seen it had told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. I need to stop here just a moment because those last few words, Lord, they break my heart. I can't imagine what the apostles were thinking even more. I can't imagine what, what Jesus was thinking. Talk about being men of sorrows acquainted with grief. What did those last few words say? They said, then the people began to plead with Jesus. And what did they plead with Jesus? They plead with Jesus to leave the region. This has to be one of the sadder lines in all the Bible. I've been studying the Bible for years. This has to be one of the saddest lines in all the Bible. And this has to be one of the more sad moments that has ever taken place in recorded history. One would think when they saw what happened, they would have responded like those on the other side of the Sea of Galilee after hearing the Sermon on the Mount, and what were they? They were absolutely astonished. One would think that they would have responded to the apostles that after seeing miracle after miracle, and they marveled and they asked this question, who is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. But that is not how the herdsmen responded, and that's not how the townspeople responded either. What did they do? Well, the scripture just told us very plainly what they did. All of them did what? All of them begged Jesus, begged Jesus to do what? To leave their region. And he did. And he did. And he did. If that wasn't true for the man who was healed, look with me what happens to him. Look at verses 18 through 20. As Jesus was getting in the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Can you believe him? Jesus did not, not let him, but said, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for who? Done for you. And how he has had mercy on who? Mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in Decapolis how much Christ had done for him. And all the people were amazed. What does that mean? It means they were extraordinarily impressed. Now, what can we learn from this account? There's a lot we can learn from this particular account. And as I prayed over and read the scripture over and over and over again, the Lord placed six things within my heart that he told me to share with you this morning. And the first one is this. The demon-possessed man, he was wild. There's no doubt about that. He was dangerous. There's no doubt about that. He was tormented. There's no doubt about that. He was violent. There's no doubt about that. The people had tried to subdue him. They even put chains around him. But he was too strong, and he broke the chains, and he even broke the shackles into pieces before their eyes. And as a result, what took place? All the people were up there. They didn't even want to go anywhere near him. They never traveled on that road. No one could help him, and make no mistake about it, he could not help himself. Humanly speaking, what was he? Well, humanly speaking, he was a hopeless case, but that was not true for Jesus. Back then, right now, or whatever may come in the future, it was not true for Jesus. What did Jesus do? He went where no one else was willing to go to do what no one else could ever do. What a powerful reminder out of a very important truth we do well to put in the depth of our heart. And the truth is this. No, absolutely no, is beyond the reach of Jesus Christ. Let me be specific. He can forgive anyone. He can restore anyone. Anyone. 
who genuinely comes to him in repentance, anyone who genuinely comes to him asking for forgiveness, anyone who wants to walk by faith, to walk in newness of life, can have that happen because of the power and the love of Jesus. Think with me about this man's condition. Who among us could say that we've been under more oppression than this guy? I don't think any of us could say that. This man was filled with demons and he's living in a graveyard. And yet what did the Lord do for him? He restored him. And I want you to know something in a practical way, but it's not just a practical illustration. It's a biblical truth. The same Jesus who restored him can restore you. Amen. Let me be real specific. He can restore your reputation. You ever think, oh my gracious, I just wish I could start my days over again. He can restore your marriage. You ever have a little shaky time in your marriage? I think all of us have at one time or another. He can restore your family. You ever have some family travail where you get a little trouble in your heart? You get, get a little fearful? He can restore your friendships. If you have some people moving away from you and you want to see them come back to you, he can restore that. He can restore your vocational life. You ever have some problems on the job and you just think, oh, I just can't stand this job anymore. And no, make no mistake about it, he can restore your faith. And aren't you glad for that? No case is too hopeless for Jesus Christ. Back in the 1970s, if you've been around for a while, you remember that there was a man who was pretty well known. His name was Chuck Colson. Chuck Colson during the 1970s was known as the hatchet man of the White House. Remember him? He was with Richard Nixon, the president, and he went to prison for the Watergate crimes. And when he went to prison, let me tell you what happened to him. He becomes a Christian. After becoming a Christian, he starts to admit some of the things that he had done were really hurtful. And he really regarded all the different people he led astray and all the different people he hurt. But make no mistake about it, Jesus Christ absolutely changed his life. If you're not aware, let me tell you that Charles Colson not only became a Christian, he became a very prolific Christian writer and speaker, and he founded something that's such a wonderful blessing in this world. He founded Prison Fellowship Ministry. Now we say amen to that very quickly, and well we should, but the power of Jesus Christ did not stop with Charles Colson. Can you go a little deeper? Are you willing to go a little deeper? Can we go a whole lot deeper? Can we go so deep that you may be surprised these words even come from my mouth? But it expresses the biblical truth. I'm not going to hold back on it because I want to share with you the biblical truth as much as I can. Years ago, if you've been alive for a while, you know another name. Maybe when you first hear it, it won't ring the bell completely, but it will sound somewhat familiar. Who are you talking about, Pastor Ron? I'm talking about a man by the name of Jeffrey Dahmer. Remember Jeffrey Dahmer? Now, he was interviewing. When he was interviewing in prison, getting ready to lose his life, he talked about the person who was interviewing him about the fact that he had asked Jesus Christ into his life. Now, let me remind you, if you don't know who I'm talking about, this is the man who not only took a lot of people's lives, this is the man who consumed a lot of the people he killed. That's about as delicately as I can say it. I think about that, and I think that's just absolutely unthinkable, and there's no doubt about it. But if his, Jeffrey Dahmer's, confession was real, if his repentance was real, he was not beyond the reach, the power, and the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's how powerful Jesus Amen. is. Now let me be personal. We may not be as well known as Charles Colson. We may not have a sword cast like Jeffrey Dahmer, but we are just as hopeless on our own and in every bit as much in need of a Savior. Jesus knows that, and that's why he came to earth. That's why he came here and went to the cross, and he didn't just go to the cross for other people. He came and went to the cross for us. He came and went to the cross for you. He went to the cross for me. But there's a second thing that I see in this story that the Lord has put in my heart to share with you, and it's this. This man may have overpowered other people. He may have overpowered other things. But he was no match for Jesus Christ. Now think about what was going on in this particular account. Society had threatened this man. Society had tried to restrain this man. Society had tried to isolate this man. And none of these actions, as earnest as they were, had any effect at all. But that was not true when it came to Jesus Christ. Earlier, what did we see about Jesus? He has authority over disease. He has authority over impairment. He even has authority over nature. And here he shows that he has a power and authority over evil itself. And amen to that. Now, when we look around this world, what do we see? If we're looking clearly, 
We're not to focus on it. We're not to drink gallons of it. We're not to say this is our only thought, and that's a bad thing if you do that. We're to think on things that are good, pure, and holy. If there be any virtue, be any praise, think on these things in Philippians 4. It talks about that. But when we look around, what do we see? We see examples of evil. Let me just talk to you about a few of them that we're all familiar with. People are sometimes wrongly imprisoned. I heard an amazing story about a guy who was a policeman and framed a guy to try to keep from having some big punishment of his own. And then later on, years, decades after being in prison, he meets this man again. And they're both at church. And when they're both at church, the one guy, the policeman, said, I'm just so sorry I took decades of your life. And let me tell you what happened. They started a mentor program, and the policeman who framed this man went up to the man who had lost years inappropriately of his life in jail. They not only became friends, they became brothers. And they had a ministry that they did together. Talk about the power of Christ. Sometimes people are wrongly in prison. In parts of the world right now, what's going on? People are being beheaded. There are places where people send food. It's not something that just started a long time ago. It's been going on for a long time to starving people. And what happens? All of a sudden, some greedy countrymen come in in positions of power and take the food that's been sent to those who are there. Over and over and on and on we could go. I don't believe that any of the condition that evil is in this world and it's a powerful force. But here in my heart, but far more importantly, hear God's word. Evil is no match for Jesus Christ. You're not going to hear that every day, so hear it again. Evil is no match for Jesus Christ. Yes, there are atrocities in the world, and they are growing both in number and in intensity, but in accordance with Jesus. That is exactly what he said was going to take place if you read the book of Matthew. And that is exactly what the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter, chapter 2 when it talks about describing the last days. Yet in the midst of all the pain and strait, be assured of this, it is only a matter of time before something takes place, and I'll tell you what it is. It's when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. When I read and when I read over and over and over again, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. As I prayed over this particular passage time and again, I remembered the power of Jesus. And I'll tell you how it affected me. It gave me peace. It gave me strength. It gave me hope. And I'll tell you what else it gave me. It gave me endurance to finish well, to finish strong. There's a third thing that the Lord put in my heart that I feel led to share with you, and it's this. Some people may wonder, like, why did Jesus grant the request of the demons to go into the pigs? Well, the text doesn't tell us specifically, so we can only speculate, but I will share with you my speculation. It's only my speculation. It seems to me that Jesus allowed that to happen because he wants us to know that evil is real. So a lot of times we just say it's a mistake or it's this or that. Evil is very real, and... What else does he want us to know? He wants us to know that healing is possible. But one thing is for sure, and one thing is for certain, Jesus drove home the worth and the value of the human soul. So many times people want popularity. So many times people want riches of one form or another. So many times people want to have a talent or this or that or the other thing, but nothing is worth more than the human soul. And let me tell you why. Because the human soul, it lasts forever. And the human soul is absolutely invaluable. I also think that he allowed these demons to go into the pigs because he wanted to use it as an evangelism expression. What did the restored man do? Well, the news had been told by him far and wide that Jesus didn't just cast the demons into the abyss as they had requested. They were spared. Why is that important to know? Because the Lord has order in his Bible. The Lord's not going to stray from his Bible. He tells us that certain things are going to happen, and then he does things in accordance with what's been written in the Scripture. What does that mean? It means the Lord is faithful, and he always stays true to his word. These things are not coincidental. Let me share with you a fourth thing. Although the text doesn't tell us why Jesus sent the demons into the pigs, it does tell us how the herdsmen and the townspeople responded. What did they do? They begged. Can you imagine this? They begged Jesus to leave. To me, that's amazing. To me, that's astonishing. Let me tell you what else it is. To me, it's utterly heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. It's hard to imagine why anyone would ask Jesus to leave. Maybe they cared more about their pigs than they cared about people. We see that today still, don't we? A lot of different expressions. 
Maybe they feared losing their livestock and the effects it would have on their livelihood. And we see examples of that all the time today, too. They have been afraid of not only the demon possessed man, but they may have feared Jesus. After all, it's one thing to resonate with the illustrations we see of Jesus in a children's picture book. It's a whole other thing to come to terms and picture him in the way that we see him in the Bible. There's a fifth thing that I feel like I should have addressed this. When Jesus was begged to leave, what did he do? He left. Well, that stops me in my tracks. That wakes me up. What does that mean? It means the Lord doesn't force himself on anyone. The Lord doesn't stay where he's not wanted. What a vivid reminder to turn him not aside. The Bible says what? It says, today is the day of salvation. Harden not your heart. So if you're here today and you haven't done that, guess what? Today is a wonderful opportunity to receive forgiveness. And if you're here today, you can ask him to forgive you of your sins and to come into your heart. And if you're here today and you know that you've drifted a little bit, you're not as strong as you want to be, and you know you're not as strong as you've been called to be, guess what? You can start over and begin to walk in nearness of life. Now let me share with you the final thing that the Lord put in my heart. Jesus granted the request of the demons to cast them into the pigs. Why? And he granted the request of the people who asked them to leave. Why? Well, Jesus did those things for them, but he didn't do what he did for them, for the restored man. Instead of saying, you can come with me, he tells him to stay there. Why would he stay there? Why was he called to stay there? He was called to stay there to testify of the power of God. He was called to stay there to testify to the power of God who had changed his life. The Bible tells us, he didn't go into a big argument, I want to go with you, I want to go with you. What did he do? He chose to obey. And when he chose to obey, what happened? The word about Jesus went out far, and the word about Jesus went out wide. Let me speak with you. You don't have to preach a sermon. I'm more important, more important than anybody else. Sometimes people say, your church. I say, no, this isn't my church. This is God's church. Mm -hmm. And if it comes yeah. down to who's able to use the church, it's, it's our church. It's not, it's not my church, that's for sure. You don't have to preach a sermon. In fact, you preach a lot of sermons just like I do before I ever get behind a podium anywhere. You don't have to preach a sermon. You don't have to write a book. It's good if you can write a book, but you don't have to write a book. You don't have to travel to a far-off country. All you need to do is talk to people who are in your life about the things Christ has done in your everyday world and talk about how he has changed you. Changed you when you read his word. Changed you when you make first things first. Changed you when you're faithfully using your spiritual gift and engaged in the game. Absolutely changed your life. And it's my prayer, when you do meet people, and they are strained, or they've never met the Lord, that you invite them to church. Not so we just have another person sitting in the chairs, but because we are stronger together, we're more resilient together, we're more defined together, we're more able together, we're more equipped together, and God has called us to meet together, and they well, as we close, let's get back to the first question we asked at the very beginning. Who is this one whose name Jesus? That's a question of all questions. No other question ever has been, and no other question ever will be more important than this one. The scripture tells us very plainly when it comes to this question that how we choose to answer that question it affects our lives. There's no doubt about that. And it also determines our destination throughout all of eternity. But there's a second question that follows this first one. What is it? How will I respond? How will I respond? You know, you can't choose how anyone else will respond, but you're the only person in the world who can make the choice about how you'll respond. What did we see in this particular passage in Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20? We saw that some people who encountered Jesus, they were amazed. Some people who encountered Jesus, they were marveled. Some people who followed, who came upon Jesus, they followed him. And then we saw a man today who wanted to go with him, but the Lord said, I've got another mission for you, and here's what I want you to do. And what did that man do? He faithfully obeyed. But that's not the only thing we saw in this passage, is it? What else do we see in this, with this passage? Sadly, tragically, some turned Jesus away. $5 for God, please. Just $5 for God. So as we close today, 
Think with me about how you answer these questions. That's what I've been thinking about in my own life. Who is Jesus to you? How do you choose to respond to him? When we choose, like the man, to obey him, guess what starts to happen? Our lives change. And we're positioned then to make a difference in his name. Well, the countrymen, they rejected Jesus and begged him to leave. But the man who had been demon-possessed, what did he do? He shared his story. And in response to him sharing his story, what happened? A whole bunch of people responded and came to Christ. Talk about beauty for ashes. Talk about changing shameful marks into emblems of honor. Like the man in this story, we too can have an amazing impact in this world. But we have to make the choice. A choice that no one can make for us but ourselves. We have to make the choice to respond. Respond. Give him an opportunity. And when we do, he honors it. But he's not going to force himself on us. But you know what? Storms, they come and go. Evil, very real, very powerful. But there is one who is a calmer of the storms. And there is one who is stronger than evil. And when he isn't just someone you know in your head, but someone you follow in your heart, it changes everything. Let it change you. May it change me. May it change us. Let's make the choice to respond. Let's let go, let go, and watch him do his great work. Let's go to the Father, we live in a world that we hardly recognize because things have changed so quickly. Father, we live in a world that makes us read 1 Timothy and say, oh my gracious, um, the world has changed so much since I was a child. And then we think, what would our grandmothers and our great grandmothers and grandfathers have when they see the things that go on? Not just in our country, it's so easy just to center on what's going on in our neighborhood or in our country, but things going on in the world. We know evil's been long around for a long time, and it's potency we're well aware of. But Father, we also know that you are strong. Father, may we really get into you like never before. May we read your word. May we invite your word to read us. May we pray and then may we live out the prayer that we pray. May we think and we may go to you when we have to make decisions before we respond. May we recognize that we don't have to be strong enough in and of ourselves to handle the things that come our way because you're right beside us and you're stronger. Father, I pray, Lord, that today we would think on things that are good, pure, and holy, and we'd be aware that we have that opportunity, we have that invitation because of the power of Christ. May we never forget the power of Christ. May we recognize that someday every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. But in the meantime, we are not helpless. In the meantime, we are not hopeless. We have Jesus. And when we have Jesus, He is enough and we have enough in us. Father, help us to have that driven home in our spirit. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand and join us.